I moved into my mother's house after being gone for 12 years. Hashtag yikes. <laughs> I had no clue what I was in to learn. I was now an adult, 30 years old, and my mother had been an empty nester since I moved out when I was 18. We were just two different people, two different women. Now, I have to be honest with you, I did not come back home in the best condition. I was in the midst of what many are calling a quarter-life crisis. I was in a ton of debt, over $100,000 in student loans. I was underemployed, suffering from severe depression and anxiety, and I had gained 25 pounds in a one-year period. Physically, mentally, and spiritually, I was at rock bottom. And I was mad. Mad because I had done everything they said I should do to be successful. In fact, I went beyond what they said I should do. And here I was, moving back into my mother's home at age 30. I was unhappy, and I was dissatisfied with my quality of life. This was the state that I entered my mother's front door, broken and hard. She offered me a guest room. She didn't require that I pay any rent. She only asked that I clean the room up. I have to be honest, most times I didn't do that. She didn't force me to find a new job. She actually encouraged me to rest and restore and rediscover my purpose. Now, I have done a lot of self-development work. Additionally, I am a certified life coach and a trained facilitator. I share this only to say I'm pretty self-aware. Aware of when I am soft and open and when I'm hard and shutting down. I'm also aware of when I'm triggered. And when I moved back home with my mom, I was triggered all the time by any and everything, especially my mom, <laughs> my mother. My mother was a single parent of two. She had my older brother when she was 16 and me at 25. Now, prior to having my brother, my mother had big ambition. I need you to know this about my mother. She's extremely innovative. She's forward thinking and she wanted to go to college. But when she became pregnant with my brother, she was told that her only option as a teen mom was to stay home, get a job, and raise her kid. And so that's what she did. Now, by the time I was in the third grade, my older brother went off to college. And I became a latchkey kid. Some of you may know this. You know the routine. You get off the school bus. You make sure no one is watching, get the key from under the mat, open the door, go inside the door, lock the door. And unless it was Jesus Christ himself knocking, <laughs> under no circumstances were you to open that door. My mother was absent from many things, most things. I never had a parent attend an open house. I signed all my own permission slips and paperwork. I uh, double checked my own homework. And when I became involved in school, it was rare that I seen a loved one in the audience. I felt neglected and abandoned as a child and I carried this into my adulthood. I also felt ill-prepared for life. Like I had not been given the proper tools and, and skills to close the gaps that I found myself falling into. I always felt like I was playing catch up. Moving back home triggered all of my original wounds and my inner little girl was enraged. My believed childhood abandonment and neglect spilled out into every aspect of my life. See, I carried core beliefs that I was unlikable and that I was unlovable. And my story was I was all alone in the world. It wasn't until I moved back home that I realized the depth of my anger and resentment, how much of it was misdirected to, towards my mother and the role that it was playing in my current life and how I loved and how I functioned I knew I had forgiveness work to do. And I was lucky enough to have a mother who was willing to do this work with me. So I gave us an assignment of writing a list of all the things we felt the other person should apologize for. Hashtag yikes. <laughs> this is a true story. We went into our room. We came back out 20 minutes later and we shared our list. She had roughly four things. I had four pages. <laughs> I was mad about everything. How she didn't pick me up from school on time one time. How she didn't um, teach me how to cook. How she didn't show up to my course recital. The fact that she had chosen my father, 
who was absent for most of my life. I need you to hear this. I had made my mother wrong since my conception. Now my mother's list was different, modest, piercing. I feel unseen by you. I feel unheard by you. I feel dismissed by you. I feel disrespected by you. Our lists were very different. We had two different perspectives of what happened. Two different tellings of history. And my mom kept saying things like, you know, I don't know why you're so caught up in the past. I've grown, I'm not even the same person. And I kept trying to explain to her, mom, it's the past that's keeping me from moving forward. One thing I knew for sure is that my mother had evolved. She was this beautiful, blossomed woman. But I was stuck, stuck inside of my childhood story. Now, I had done enough self-work to know that my belief of my personal history was actually inaccurate, right? Yes, my mother was absent often, but often she was working. And often she was figuring out how to make ends meet. And often she was figuring out how to put food on our table and clothes on our back. And yes, sometimes she was at the nightclub. And sometimes she was playing bingo. And sometimes she was doing whatever she was doing as a 30-year-old woman. I told you where I was as a 30-year-old woman. But what I knew for sure is that my mother loved my brother and I. And she did the best she could in the condition that she was in at that time. Letting go of my past felt like I was justifying the behavior of the people who I felt had violated me. So I had to stay stuck. I had to stay stuck because I needed to prove to them that I was right, that I had been wronged. I held my mother hostage in this static one-dimensional perception, an image that I created of her as a child. The gift of coming back home at age 30 was the fact that I was allowed the beautiful opportunity to see my mother, to hear her, to acknowledge her as a woman, and to respect her as a human being. I started to think about our relationship and parent-child relationships in general. There is something inherently wrong with the way we do mother and daughter relationships, or father and son for that matter, parent-daughter relationships. Our current model says that one party is passive, while the other party is active and carries the entire onus for maintaining the nurturing of that relationship. Let's think about this. Even in our language, we use the words mothering and fathering, right? We each have our own definition of, it, of what a mother is or what a father is or what it means to mother or father, even if we don't have a, a ready operational definition. But we don't use the same kind of language when it comes to children. We don't say daughtering and sonning. So that's what I offer to you today. What is our role as children? How do we daughter our mothers? How do we son our fathers, etc.? Okay? If you think about the word, or the suffix rather, ing, it means to make something active, to make it ongoing and present. Daughtering or sonning can be defined as children who are present, who are active, and who are in the now in their relationship with their parents. It is the daughter who is intentional in how she shows up. It is the son who knows there is no such thing as opting out of being a son. It is the child who is in the now. They're not living in the past with their parents. They have released their parent from their believed shortcomings and wrongdoing, as well as released them from those unrealistic expectations that we have of parents. Self-help author Louise Hay, in her book, You Can Heal Your Life, suggests that before we become humans, before we incarnate, when we are spirits, we actually choose our parents. We choose them because they are the perfect people to give us the perfect experience that our soul needs. I want you to think about this for a little bit. Now, many of you will reject Hayes' theory. You will also reject what I'm saying. You will say, I can never, ever forgive my parents for what they have done. Releasing your parents is not just for them, it is for you. See, these stories we hoard in our body, they eat us alive. For you to thrive, 
for you to function, for you to love in all the other relationships you have, you have to heal those original wounds. Now, my belief is that we are all spirit beings having an earthly experience. None of us came to earth with an instruction manual. Guess what? Your, hum your parent is a human having an experience. Leave them alone. <laughs> Honor their journey. Hear their stories. You are charged, or I charge you rather, to love your parent as human first, parent second. I charge you to restore compassion towards your parents. And I beg you to make a commitment to always go back to the soft. And what I mean by this is make a commit to, commitment to opening your heart over and over and over and over again. Every time you feel triggered, every time you find yourself closing down because you owe your parents that. So mother, I owe you an apology. I was so caught up in my own suffering, I failed to ask who is to blame for yours. I see you, your beauty, your magnificence, all your efforts and sacrifice, your intention and your wisdom. Thank you so much for allowing me to share this story. May our story heal the world.